Let's begin, inshallah. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Anbiya wa al-Mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad. Wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa barik wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad. Wa ala ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad. Wa barik wa sallim. اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم أما بعد. In the previous class we had, we we spoke of uh, the whole chapter regarding the essentials of knowledge, and how that whatever knowledge we attain in Sharia, in Deen, in Islam, we need to put that into practice in whichever way possible. Uh, out of fear that we would be in the third category. So we spoke about three categories of individuals, those who are the faizin or the successful, who learn the knowledge of deen so that they may have some provision for the hereafter, so that they know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be prepared for Jannah and, and uh, you know, getting the, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is their concern and their niyyah. The second group was those who are in the middle of the two groups and are in danger. Uh, if, the, if they do not get the tawfiq to you know, do tawbah and return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there's a fear that they would be part of the third group, which is those individuals who believe that they are doing well. However, in reality, they're not. They have attained the knowledge of deen, but they, they do not have the practice that backs up this knowledge. And they speak the words of deen. They speak the words of scholars. They speak righteous words and they command righteousness. However, their actions is contradictory to their knowledge. So this is what we spoke about last time. And Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah really emphasized and, and uh, advised us very strongly uh, to be amongst the first group and to really avoid the, the other two groups because Number three is just, we do not want to be there because that is like a seal. Uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Summum bukmun umyun. That's in reference to the kuffar and the munafiqeen. However, we can utilize this ayah and say that, you know, it can even apply to believers where their, their ears, their hearts, their minds are all shut off. They're unable to accept the truth because they believe they already have it. So they are not going to seek tawbah. They believe that they're well off and this is very dangerous. So we should truly avoid uh, the last two categories and strive to the, the greatest amount of our ability to be amongst the first. The last thing we spoke about last time was that Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah said, what is the Bidayatul Hidayah? And that is the name of the book that we are uh, going through. Bidayatul Hidayah, the beginning of guidance. So what really is it? In one word, it is taqwa. And this book is talking about the beginnings of taqwa. There is a uh, beginner level of taqwa, there's an intermediate level of taqwa, and then there's an advanced level of taqwa. We can never hope to reach the advanced level if we do not have the foundational beginner level of taqwa, which is what he will be talking to us here after he has defined what taqwa was, which was that taqwa is to fulfill the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as to avoid the prohibitions. So once these two aspects are found in our lives, then that is true taqwa. Taqwa does not mean that, you know, I have tears coming down when I perform salah. Taqwa does not mean that I have emotion uh, when, when I perform my ibadat. Yes, that is a thamara or a fruit of taqwa that Allah may give to people. But true taqwa is whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded me. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me to perform those actions. And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited in my life, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is impermissible, I avoid all of those things. That is true taqwa. Oftentimes we find ourselves fulfilling the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, performing salah, giving in charity, 
zakat or sadaqat, whatever it may be, fasting in the month of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, we feel like sometimes like this third category, we feel complacent that I am doing uh, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded of me. So alhamdulillah, that is half of taqwa. We're doing half of taqwa by fulfilling these acts of worship, these ibadat. But we cannot forget the second half. And the second half is ijtinabu nawahi, is to avoid the prohibitions. So we need to, just, just as it is important for us to engage in these acts of worship, it is just as important for us to avoid all of the sins. We need to avoid all of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to avoid. And that is the true guidance, knowing what to do, first of all, knowing what are, what are the things commanded and knowing what are the things that are prohibited and then putting those into action. So this is what we want to achieve through this book. Very simple basics. Uh, and, and this is what Imam Ghazali rahimahullah is going to speak to us about. So he splits the book in half. One portion is regarding ta'at. So he says, al-qism al fi ta'at. The first portion of the book regarding uh, actions that are commanded. So things that we have to do. And the second book, uh, second portion of the book will be those things which we must avoid. Al-qism al fi ta'at. He begins by saying, I'lam anna awamir Allah ta'ala fara'ib wa nawafil. He said that bear in mind the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are either going to be farb or nafal. So these are all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have these two. These are concepts that we understand. Sunnas, everything else, all fall under nawafil. These are extra ibadat that we have been given. And the fara'id are the essentials that we must, we, we absolutely must perform these actions. فَالْفَرْضُ رَأْسُ الْمَالِ وَبِهِ تَحْصُلُ النَّجَاءِ وَالنَّفْلُ هُوَ الْرِبْحُ وَبِهِ الْفَوْزُ بِالْدَرَجَاتِ So Imam Al-Ghazali is comparing the fara'id and the nawafil to an investment. He says, farud is your initial investment. What happens when we invest? We save up some money. This is our absolutely, uh, you know, the, the, the necess necessary amount which we have and we spend that in a specific avenue which we feel is going to be lucrative. We spend that money and then we get profit back from that. Hopefully, if it's a good investment, you get profit back from it. But one aspect that investors have is that you can never lose that initial investment. If a person starts to lose their initial investment, we're not even talking about profit here, they're not profiting and they're actually decreasing in the initial investment, that is a very serious thing and you may have to leave out of that investment, take pull out of that investment with some losses just to prevent losing the entire investment. And the thing that we want from our investment is that profit. So now how does he compare fara'id and nawafil to investment? He says the fard, whether that be the fara'id of salah or five times salah or our fasting, which is the fasting that we are observing now in the blessed month of Ramadan, Hajj, Zakat, all of these are fara'il. The fard is your initial investment. This is something you must absolutely have. Never allow that to dip below the initial investment. Just like when you invest in a business, you never want to see that your initial amount that you've invested for that to decrease. That's you know a very dangerous place to be in. So the same thing, when it comes for fara'il, we never want to see those fara'il being missed out. We want our fara'id to be completely there. And then we want profit on top of that. So he's saying, farud is your ra'sul mal. It's your initial investment. Wabihi tahsulun najah. You will get salvation if you have your fara'id. So this is the bare minimum that we must have. And we all want salvation. We want to be free from the fire of Jahannam. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. And ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward and the jannah in the hereafter. So this is what we will have if we have the fara'id. So alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not make the fara'id so difficult for us that it's impossible for us to do. We all are aware of the story of Mi'raj where Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa first received the gift of salah and it was 50 salawat. Now that is very difficult for a person. You know, in our context, we would find it extremely difficult. 
to perform 50 salawat. We're, we're just doing an extra 20 rakahs of taraweeh and we feel exhausted on a daily basis in Ramadan. Imagine 50 fara'id. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very easy for us to fulfill all of the fara'id, whether that's salah, psalm, zakat, hajj, etc. So that is our ra'sul mal. And with that, inshallah, Allah made it possible that if we just do these fara'id and we do them properly, also we have to be aware that we have to stay away from the prohibitions. But if we do the fara'id properly, that inshallah will allow us to have that najat, that salvation in the hereafter. And that's what we really want. So that's what he says, fard is, is your initial investment, your ra'sul mal. nafal huwa ribh wa bihil fawzu bid-darajat. Nafal is your profit. So again, we go back to the comparison of investing. What is our goal when we invest? You don't just put money into a business that someone has pitched you and not expect anything back. You do sometimes give someone some, you know, loan some money, uh, an Islamic loan where you don't want anything back. You just pay the exact amount back and you'll get the reward for that. But when we're really considering investing, we want to invest in something that's going to get the maximum amount of returns. If I know if I invest in one business, I'm going to get twice my money back. However, in another business, I'll get 10 times my money back. Definitely, I'll invest in the 10 times business. So this is really important. So he says, Nafal is your rewh, is your profit. And that means that you have to have your initial fard and then do the nafal on top of that. It doesn't make sense for us to engage in nawafil, to engage in so many extra prayers whether it be taraweeh, whether it be tahajjud, and we're missing Salatul Fajr, or we're missing Salatul Isha, it doesn't make sense. So nafal is something that is built on top of the fard. And wabihil fawzu bid darajat, you will get the highest levels of success with the nafal. So fard is going to allow you to get the success and najat, and nafal is going to allow you to get the higher stages. One second, this, my window is open, so some noise coming from outside. So this is really important that we understand this comparison. We must have that initial investment sealed and solid. You know, we, we absolutely can't let that happen where we miss one of the five times salahs. And then once we have that, we have it down where we're very punctual with it. Inshallah, we can start getting a lot of profit by doing extra the sunnah prayers, the nawafil, that is going to be our profit. So this is a very beautiful comparison. Then Imam al-Ghazali says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ So this is a hadith Qudsi where Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم is quoting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith. Allah says, مَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ الْمُتَقَرِّبُونَ بِمِثْلِ أَدَاءِ مَفْتَرَبْتُهُ عَلَيْهِمْ There is no other thing which the seekers of me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who seek my pleasure, the best way they can get close to me is through fulfilling the fard actions. So from this statement, and this is a hadith Qudsi, what Allah is saying, Allah is telling us the best way we can get to close, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to get the favor of Allah, the, the closeness and the kindness and mercy of Allah is to fulfill the fara'id. وَلَا يَزَالُ الْعَبْدُ يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ So the best way is the fara'id, and then Allah says that a slave of mine will continue to perform nawafil. So he's doing the fard and he's getting closer. And then he, on top of that, he's doing nawafil. And he reaches a point, hatta uhibbahu. And he reaches a point where I love him. So Allah is saying that I will love him once he reaches that point. So this is a very beautiful hadith, very clear. How do we get the love of Allah? This is what we all want. This is the secret, right? The secret of success. Everyone goes, when it comes to financial success in, in dunya, they go to these different, uh, you know, investment gurus and they ask them, like, how, what's your secret? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the secret. We don't have to go to anyone. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do your fara'id, and that is how you'll get close to me. Perform your nafal, and that's how I'll love you. So this is the secret to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ 
kuntu sam'ahu alladhi yasma'u bih wa basarahu alladhi yubsiru bih wa lisanahu alladhi yantiqu bih wa yadahu allati yabtishu biha wa rijlahu allati yamshi biha then the hadith Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what happens when i when i love you what happens when allah loves us fa idha ahbabtuhu when i love that slave i become his hearing which with he hears i become the sight with which he sees i become the tongue which with he speaks with and i become the hands with which he grabs onto things and i become the feet in which he walks so this is obviously not literal this is the beauty in the speech allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying when when we receive the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever we look at the first thing that comes to mind is the pleasure of allah whatever we hear the first thing that comes into mind is this what i'm hearing going to receive the pleasure of allah or is going to get his anger when it comes to uh, speaking what i'm going to say now is is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to be happy with my speech when it comes to whatever my hands do physical work my my kasb my earnings are they halal is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to be happy many people they, they're not thinking of this when they engage in business the first thing that comes to mind is profit i don't care about anything else whether it goes you know into gambling into riba into uh, haram i just want the profit then they feel regret later on but when a person is beloved by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first thing that comes to mind is is it going to be according to the sharia is it going to be according to what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the feet with which this person walks that person will only walk towards khair someone says hey let's go to the movie theater he says no you know i i, I can't even think about that person says let's go to a, a nightclub or some some haram place this person says no wa idha marru bil laghwi marru kirama in in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the ibadur rahman the beloved slaves of allah one of the qualities one of the qualities of them is when they pass by laghu unnecessary things things that distract a person from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala marru kirama they don't say anything they put their head down and they keep going they ignore it and they keep on going towards the rahma and the forgiveness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the dhikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is a very beautiful hadith in this hadith we see how we can get close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number 1 we get close by fulfilling the fara'id and number 2 we achieve the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by performing the nawafil and that is exactly why imam al ghazali says fard is your investment and nafal is your profit so investment is getting close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then when you really want a profit when you really want the fruits of the taqwa then you have to get involved in nawafil So this is something we have to keep in mind and this is a blessed time for this to 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 be reminded of this that this is the perfect time because everything is amplified our faraid 70 times more our nawafil like faraid so now imagine your your profit that you're getting is you know expounded um your 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 initial investment is just exponentially rising and so this is what the month of ramadan is And then Imam Al-Ghazali advises us, "Falan tasila ayyuha at-talib ila al-qiyam bi awamir Allah Ta'ala illa bi muraqabati qalbik wa jawarihik fi lahadatika wa anfasik min hin tumsi ila hin tusbih." He says, "O oh, seeker of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala's pleasure." That is us inshallah, we are the seekers of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala's pleasure. You will never reach that p- position, the maqam, the stage of fulfilling the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless you are continuously looking at your heart you're con- con- continuously observing introspecting looking at the condition of your heart and your body parts in every single aspect of your life fi lahadatika wa anfasik in your bre- breathing in every aspect of your life you have to be very observant we have to be very mindful of what we're doing from the time i wake up till the time i go to sleep at night all of my prayers even when i enter the restroom when i come out all of these things we have to be continuously in aware of what we're doing as a believer we don't do anything as as a ghafil or or uh, negligent 
We're doing everything with a, a mindfulness state. And this is what he's talking about. And this is exactly what we're going to talk about in the kitab. You may be thinking, how can I use the restroom and be mindful? How can I sleep and be mindful? How can I wake up from sleep and be mindful? That's very difficult. But inshallah, these are what he is going to explain to us. Know this very well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely aware of what is happening inside you. In your mind, in your heart, your thoughts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is completely aware. He is aware of your physical, you know, whether that is your clothing or your body or what you are doing physically and the batin and the inside. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. So much so in Surah Tutaha, Ya'alamu Sirra wa Akhfa, some scholars say that what is this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the hidden that which you and I hide, and that which is more hidden. So what's more hidden than what we hide? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we hide, and he knows what's even more hidden than that. One of my teachers, when we were studying tafsir, he says, sometimes you're sitting, and you may be daydreaming. You don't know what you're thinking about, especially nowadays when we have the fog, the brain fog of fasting. You may be sitting sometimes, and you don't even know what you're thinking about. You're thinking about something. You're not really aware. And then someone calls your name and then you snap out of it and they say, what were you thinking about? You're so deep in thought and you think about it and you're like, I don't know. I can't remember. I was just so deep in thought and I don't know what I was thinking about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that in detail. We don't know it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it in detail. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the haqiqah, the, the truth of your intention deep inside. وَمُحِيطٌ بِجَمِيعِ خَطَرَاتِكَ وَلَحَظَاتِكَ وَخَطَوَاتِكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely encompasses every single one of your thoughts, every single glance that we make, every single step that we take. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows absolutely everything. He knows every single time that we're, we're motionless and every time we're in motion. And these are very beautiful words of Imam al-Ghazali because something is, every single thing that exists, it's either going to be in movement or not in movement. Other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our imagination. But this entire universe, if you imagine anything, just imagine anything, it's either going to be motionless or in motion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every one of these things. So that just covers every single thing in the universe. And when you are alone, you believe you're alone. We think that we're alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. When you are completely alone, you're not alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there with us. So this is what we have to have, the mindfulness as a believer, that my life, it has a purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created me. And he is always aware of everything that I do. Even if I am not aware, Allah is aware. He knows the hidden and he knows even more deeper than that. There is nothing in the mulk and malakut. So these are two terms that Imam al-Ghazali is using. What is the mulk? The mulk is this universe. The malakut, what we cannot see, the ghayb. Angels, things in the ghayb, jannah, jahannam, we can't see them. They're not contained in what we can physically observe. So if there's anything that even moves in this entire universe, the mulk, as well as in the ghayb, the malakut, or if it's sakin, if it's not moving at all, or if something does anything, there is nothing like that except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is everything in the heavens and the earth. Meaning, every single thing that moves, every single thing that exists, every single molecule, every single atom in this universe, as well as in the ghayb, and the ghayb is much, much larger than this universe. We only have to go to you know, YouTube to see how large this universe is or what the scientists have found out about this universe. And just imagine that expounded so many more times exponentially. And that is the ghayb. And they're filled with angels. It's not like it's just empty, like outer space. The angels are filled in the ghayb. So he's saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything 
of everything, every single movement, every single individual, everything that's happened. So what is the purpose of all this? We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all of this. He says, فَتَأَدَّبْ أَيُّهَا الْمِسْكِينَ ظَاهِرًا وَبَاطِنًا بَيْنَ يَدَيْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى When you know this, when you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching every single movement, not of just us, not of just, you know, this world, but this entire universe, not of just the universe, but so much more beyond the universe, which our intellect cannot perceive, then have adab, miskin. He says, ayyuhal miskin, oh poor person. And we are poor and when it comes to our a'mal, we're, we're all very poor. We need more. We're beggars. How do we know we're beggars? When you lift your dua, what are we doing? We're lifting our hand like this. Yeah, Allah. So that, that's like what, what a beggar does. So we are miskin. So he's saying, oh miskin, have adab. Physically have adab and in your heart have adab, in your mind have adab. Have adab for who? Have, have adab means having uh, etiquette, having respect, having reverence. But who do we have adab for? You are in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have adab. And, and when do we have adab? You know, when, when, when someone has adab in front of their teacher. They're showing etiquette and respect and reverence for the teacher or their parents. It's only because when the parents are there, when the parents are gone, then they can relax. They can sit, you know, fold their legs, you know, just relax. And when the parents come or the teacher comes, then you're very careful not to, you know, offend them. And you're very careful in your speech and everything like that. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there and when is he not there? He's always there. He's never not there. So always have this adab. This is what Imam Ghazali is saying. And this is why he said all of this. We have to always be cautious of this adab. And he says, Have the adab of a very low slave, a sinner, a slave that you know is, is very debased. He has sinned. He has done wrong against his master. And he is right in front of the Jabbar, the Qahar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ultimate power, the ultimate qudra, the ultimate, uh, you know, he's overpowering nature over us. Imagine that. Can we imagine for a day that we are in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We don't imagine any kind of image for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because whatever we can try to imagine, Allah is beyond that. So it's not right for us to imagine an image. But just think that Allah is watching me. At every moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at me. We'll be overwhelmed. And this is what we're supposed to do as believers. And this is the maqam or the position and the station of ihsan. So he's saying, have the wajtahid Allah yaraka mawlaka haythu nahak wa la yafqidaka haythu amarak. Try very hard that your master does not catch you doing something that he has prohibited. Be very careful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited many things. And we find that, that in the Quran and the Hadith. That's how we learn what is prohibited. So be very cautious. Be very careful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not catch us doing that. And it's not like he's not watching. He's always watching. So how do we be careful about that? We don't do it at all. And be very cautious that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you with something, you don't let any time period happen where you're not fulfilling that action. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says five times salah a day, then don't let any, any time these five times salah come, don't miss them. Because then our master, he is seeing us and we're not doing it. And he's given us the secret right now. And I know it's already 7.30. Just two more minutes inshallah. And there's, there's four more lines. And then we will conclude. He says, he gives us a secret here. There's no way you're going to be able to do this properly, be very, you know, systematically methodolo with, with a good methodology unless you have a schedule. You, you, you split up your time. Your schedule is made properly. And you organize all of your awrad. Your awrad is your wird or whatever things that you do to please Allah, whether that, whether that is fara'id or nawafil, you have a schedule. You have it planned out. Which fard am I going to do? Which nafil am I going to do? Which dhikr? You have a whole plan. And you do that from the morning till the evening. Pay attention to what I am going to deliver to you. 
pay attention to what this kitab is going to say to you. Min awamirillahi ta'ala alayk. I'm going to speak about what are the commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put upon your shoulders. Min hini tastayqidu min manamik. From the time you wake up from sleep. Ila waqti ruju'ika ila madja'ik. Until the time you go back to your sleep. So basically from the time you wake up from sleep till the time you go to sleep, we're going to discuss those things. How to have, uh, you know, ihsan and all of these things. How to really think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's plenty of du'as he's going to mention. Plenty of things that we can have a mental practice when we're making wudu, be aware and be cautious. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the fruits of all of this. Give us tawfiq to continue with this book. Give us tawfiq to put it into practice and be aware and cognizant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously aware and watching us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never loses awareness of us. It is only us that lose awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's watching. So we have to try our best. And that is what this word muraqaba is. Muraqaba, Allah is watching us and we try our best to be aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. That is what is ihsan. Jazakumullahu khairan. وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الرحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته